I don't know if, how many of you were struck yesterday if you were watching the coronation by just how ancient some of the practices were and how far back they stretched. Uh, there was a uniquely, obviously, Christian character to it, which stands out somewhat in a very modern and secular society. But there was also overtones of the fact that any power or authority in this world has to be placed in its right order. And in many ways, what we've been looking at with the story of the Exodus and how Pharaoh kind of conceives of himself, it's a case study in not understanding and getting that hierarchy of power correct. Uh, for example, the act of coronation, as we have it, as we saw yesterday, that goes back at least a thousand years uh, to the time of King Edgar. You could even argue that it was St. Columba that brought the very practice from Ireland. There's a great legend that St. Columba actually saw a vision in, of an angel that told him um, to go and crown and anoint King Aidan, which wasn't his preferred choice, but it was the idea that that was God's chosen leader. And when Columba was doing that in Scotland in 600 or so AD, in the kingdom of what was Dalriada, now is Argyllshire, you can actually still go to the spot where uh, kings would be anointed and crowned. And there's a, a footprint in the rock in Dunedin near Oban. And it's where they, f they placed their foot, and it was to symbolize the fact that they were to be grounded and connected to the land and to the people of the land that they were supposed to serve, which is a highly Christian idea. And then there's, of course, a story about King Edgar himself, the last Anglo-Saxon king in 974 AD, when he is coronated, where much of our traditions come from because um, up till that point, the people of the sovereign had to swear an oath that they, they would be faithful and before God, that they would be, have allegiance to their king. But so moved uh, was Edgar by uh, the ceremony and by the magnitude and the weight of the occasion that it said uh, that on that very, that very center point of Westminster Abbey, that he prostrated himself and bowed before God and pledged to God for him to be a servant king to his people. And so much of yesterday was filled with that imagery of the fact that the king is actually a servant and that he used to walk in the footsteps of Jesus himself, who was the king of kings, but also the greatest servant of all. And Pharaoh gets absolutely none of that, because what do we think about last week when Moses was requesting that the people may be able to go and hold a festival of worship to their God in the wilderness. Pharaoh's response was basically, you shall have no other gods before me. Why would you want to go and worship Yahweh? I don't know anything about him, and he can't be terribly important if I don't acknowledge him, because in my uh, world and in my orbit, I am basically God. And so he doesn't get it, and that's going to lead to disastrous consequences. Now, since we last picked up the story, we've had the famous 10 plagues, and I'm sure you know most, if not all of them, and you'll remember a lot of them from Sunday school lessons. And so, um, I didn't think you would be very forgiving if I went through and preached through every single plague week by week. So, I've, <laughs> I've decided to go over them and cover them as a unit in the introduction today, because they are a unit. In a way, they all mean the same thing. You see, if there's a tussle between Pharaoh and God, and Pharaoh thinks he is God, the plagues are very much saying to Pharaoh, actually, you're not God. You have no control over nature or the natural elements, and indeed, you didn't form and make this world. More specifically, if we think about Exodus as very much a continuation of Genesis and tied to that story of God being the one who creates, creates the world and creates humans and gives them a special place within that creation, the plagues are kind of a decreation. A um, couple of examples, uh, the water being turned into blood, um, th that's kind of a pushback against Pharaoh who, who made the Nile an instrument of death when he was instructing the young, the newborns to be thrown into it. And water is supposed to be an element of life, and it can be an element of life, but it becomes nothing but an emblem of guilt, and it's sort of decreated from its purpose. Another one, the final plague before the death of the firstborn was the darkness that covered the whole land. Now, one of the first things that God does when he creates, God said, let there be light. 
and there was light. And so that plague comes in order to demonstrate to Pharaoh that he's able to remove the good and sustaining force of his creation at any time, which Pharaoh wasn't able to do. And so we now come to this crunch point because the death of the firstborn has occurred in reaction to that. Pharaoh has seen, go, get out of here. I can't take any more of this. But the problem, as we'll see today, was it wasn't a knockout blow. It was like, you know, I don't know how many of you are as keen on boxing as I am, but you know when you see a fight that's nearly ended and you're sure the person's going to go down, they just keep coming back. And you're thinking, what will it take to knock this beast out? And that's where Pharaoh is at this point. He, he, he's on the ropes, but he decides he gets a second wind and he's going to try and fight back. So the real central character, though, in this part of the story and the dramatic escape is God. It's showing and, and foregrounding the fact that not only does God have power over Pharaoh, he has a benevolent and good and life-giving power in relation to his people, Israel. So if we're looking at God and what he does in this passage, I want to consider the fact that he permits Pharaoh, first of all, to do his worst, if you will. Secondly, that he saves his people which we all know because of the gospel, but let's look at how he does it here. And thirdly, that he destroys death. He permits Pharaoh, he saves his people, and he destroys death. Well, first of all, he he permits Pharaoh to do his worst. At the beginning of chapter 14 and verse 5, we read, when the king of Egypt was told that the people had fled, Pharaoh and his officials changed their minds about them and said, what have we done? We've let the Israelites go and have lost their services. If this was a movie, it would be a a hard cut and it would flash to Pharaoh in in his palace or wherever he's staying with his head in his hands and horror in his eyes thinking, what on earth have I done? And what's so interesting about it is that everything Pharaoh tried to prevent in the story so far has now happened. Because what was Pharaoh really worried about? Well, Firstly, he was worried that people wouldn't think that he was God and that he was very powerful. He, he, like so many other ancient rulers, and even rulers today, he was consumed and preoccupied with his own image of himself and how he appeared to others and how whatever he did was a resounding reminder of how powerful indeed he was. And that was gone. He has just let an entire people group go, and it doesn't say much about the fact that he is supposed to be um, an agent of the gods. He hasn't held on to them. He was deeply worried about that. And then secondly, what, what was he really worried about under that? Well, he was in a position of power. He had an entire free labor force which was propping up his empire and which was being able to build more grand and magnanimous buildings and be able, being able to create more and more emblems of his power and pomp and wealth. And that is all gone. And that's another injury to his pride, not to mention probably a huge economic hit to his treasury. He tried to prevent those things. And It didn't matter how hard he flailed or how many times he said, no, I will not let your people go, or I might let your people go, or how much harder he made the work for the Israelites. Remember he made them last week make bricks without straw? He doubled down on the cruelty and unfairness of the process, and what he dreaded and feared the most has happened. And what's this entirely human and and, and power-hungry response in verse 6? So he had his chariot made ready and took his army with him, 600 of the best chariots, along with all the other chariots of Egypt, with officers over all of them. His response is the equivalent of today sending a tank regiment or even an entire battalion after them. Because when he sees it, his only tool that he has at this point, he can't rule creation. He's just seen that. He can't do what, what the God of the universe can do. But what he does have is a lot of people and a lot of weapons still. So he thinks, I'll use that. That is the best and strongest tool in my box. There's nothing that the Israelites that will have that will compare with that. And I will will take control of this situation and take it back into my own hands. Now, Now, you and I reading the story, we know how this entire story ends right through to the end of Revelation. But you and I reading it maybe need to suspend that for a minute because how irrational is that? 
He's just seen a God who has brought plagues and swarms of locusts and pests and has turned the river into blood and uh, tragically that his own, even his own firstborn has died and the land's been covered in darkness. He's seen all of that and he thinks, I know, I'll send some chariots out. Can you see how deeply irrational that is? And there's often a myth that faith in God is, is, is kind of a crutch and irrational, but, but atheism and disbelief is, is perfectly rational and logical. And there may be cases to be made for both, but people, I don't think, are, are engaged to come to belief in faith in God by, by rational arguments. I think there is a rational, a logical basis for believing in God, but we're kind of awash if we think that that's going to convince anyone. Pharaoh and countless people since him have had enormous testimony put up to them about the fact that God is who He says He is, and, and He is Almighty, and it would be good not to oppose Him. And it wasn't enough, because the, the snake-like grip that whatever is, is holding on to Pharaoh on his human heart, it's too difficult to rest it off, and it takes something not natural, but indeed supernatural in order to overcome that. So Pharaoh sends the, the tank battalion in after him. And in a sense, it works because the Israelites look up and there were the Egyptians marching after them and they were terrified and cried out to the Lord. And all of this is allowed by God. And he keeps saying it over and over again, I will get glory. I will be glorified by what Pharaoh and the Egyptians are going to try to do. Now, it does terrify the people of God. Nobody wants to see a horde of chariots or a tank battalion or anything coming after them. Even if you do believe that God is there and that He is for you, that He will rescue you, no, none of us would want to have it tested like this. But God permits all of this in Pharaoh for a reason, and God keeps restating that it is so that He will get glory in the end over Egypt and the Israelites. And God will sometimes permit things in our life to play out like this, and this is where it applies to us, because we might not be facing a tyrant like Pharaoh, but we might be facing something that is intimidating and that causes a lot of fear, and that might be a person because there are people that still act tyrannical, even if they aren't the king or ruler of a country, or that might be something that is hovering over us, something coming up, or something that cause just causes so much fear and distress in our lives. In many ways, the Exodus story is archetypal. It happens over and over again in all our lives. We can all relate to looking up or looking to the horizon and seeing something that absolutely terrifies us. And, you know, again, we could ask the question, where is God? Why has God allowed this to happen? Why does God allow this to happen? And I think we're meant to feel that and wrestle with these questions. I honestly do, because the people of God do in this situation. That's their response, to be terrified. But they were terrified and cried out to the Lord. And that is their response. And I've said it before, and I will say it again, that the Bible and these stories, and indeed God Himself, does not actually answer the question of why. Why is either the suffering or this thing that I'm terrified of, why is it allowed to come and put this big black hovering shadow over my life at this point or in, the, in my future or whatever it is? And, and God doesn't say why, but He does give us something to go through the fact that He's permitting that. He gives us an example of they cried out to the Lord. That's if you like, the crag that we hang on to and that we're given us the people of God all the way through, where we think of Psalm 121. I lift my eyes to the maker of heaven and earth who helps me. The Lord, the one who keeps Israel, he will not let your foot slip or slide. That's what they do and that's what God gives us as a sense of security even through the darkness of the shadow of a tyrant coming after us, or even death itself stalking at our door. It is that God doesn't leave us without help or without His own witness, or even without the assurance that whatever is coming to us has been permitted by Him. Now, that might not initially seem comforting, but I, 
I would like to say to you that it is, because the alternative is that you live in a cosmos or a universe that is out of control, has no guiding hand, is chaotic, and the little pharaohs are running around everywhere and they're running the show. And whatever stalks at night and, and the fears that come to your heart, that they're in control and it's utterly chaotic and there's no order to any of it. But instead, if you like, the, the biblical picture and what we have in the story is that none of that is unknown to God. Not only that, but whatever it is has only been permitted by God and ultimately, and I promise you this, and I don't know what it's going to look like for you or how this part of your story will end, but I promise you from the testimony of Scripture and even from what Jesus does in the gospel that God can and will use it to bring glory to Himself. And so you will be part of a story which ultimately will glorify the King of kings and Lord of lords. And He has invited you into that. And so that means that your suffering and your fears and the shadows that stalk your heart are not in vain and they won't be wasted because they can and they will be used by God to show His greatness and His glory even through darkness and difficulty and suffering. God permits this, but He permits it for a good reason. And secondly, God provides salvation. And I think on a much more hopeful and hearty note, Moses answered the people, do not be afraid. Stand firm and you will see the deliverance the Lord will bring you today. The Lord will fight for you. You need only to be still. That word, you will see the deliverance. It's so lovely because it's the first time that the uh, that the salvation of God appears in the Bible, and particularly that it's given as a promise to the people of God. It hasn't ever been needed as much as it is now in the story of the people of God. And it's a word which we attach so much import to, and we think of salvation, and we sing about it. But for these people, it's a case of dire straits, and, and they really need that salvation. And it's the start of this word becoming, going on its own journey and, and becoming fully orbed. You see, salvation, sometimes we have given the impression that it's just about trying to get sorted out so that you go to heaven when you die. You know, we can all relate to that. <laughs> but if you're standing on the banks of a sea and there's nothing but destruction ahead of you, and you're being chased by a battalion behind you, and there's nothing but destruction behind you, <laughs> salvation uh, characterized as going to heaven when you die probably doesn't feel all that immediately soothing or comforting. You see, it's, it's, it's called the Yeshua of God, and that is the name that eventually in Hebrew ends up becoming the very name of Jesus himself, because Jesus doesn't come to just get us to heaven when we die. That is part of it, and we're going to do a Heaven and Hell series later in the year, actually, so I hope you'll stick around for that and I'll try and explain more about what I think about that then. But what does Jesus come do? As, what does He come and do as a Savior? How does He characterize His own ministry? Well, He picks up on the prophets that spoke about delivering people from oppression, from what they were struggling with, from the fact that they felt like they were wandering through the world blind without purpose and hope and meaning from the fact that they felt oppressed by either people or systems on every side, the fact that they were burdened by sickness and disease, the fact that they needed healing of all sorts. And he came and he identified as the one who would bring deliverance in all those ways. A complete savior. Yes, the removal of, as Paul says, the charge and debt of sin that stood against us, but also the fact that we needed life and life in all its fullness. And so Moses says to them, God will bring you this Yeshua, this salvation, this deliverance today. What you feel is your most pressing need for salvation right now. What's the lesson there for you and me? God will meet you exactly where you are. And so if you're feeling like figuratively, you're standing on the banks of something and you need some kind of way out and you can't see a way out, that God will meet you there. And the promise is that God will actually help take you through it, that God will deliver you. And again, that's gonna be different and personal to all of us. But God isn't interested in just 
giving us some sort of ethereal, distant hope that we'll be sitting on a cloud one day and, and everything will be fine. That's kind of stoic and disconnected from the fact that we are created beings and we live in this creation and this creation can be a source of great joy but also cause us great pain and suffering and difficulty. God, where you are feeling this need for deliverance, for hope, help, and salvation, He will meet you there. Because why, why did Jesus even come? And it's right to think of Him because this is where He gets His name from. And He sees Himself as a deliverer, like God was for the people in the Exodus. Why did he come? He came to become like one of us, to identify with our struggles, with our weaknesses, with our needs, with the fact that we don't know how to often see our way through the darkness of life. And he came to deliver us and to give us hope and restore and build up and heal our hearts once again, and to give us a life that looked like it belonged of another kingdom. You know, we're able to say, that our lives look radically different because Jesus has delivered us. Or we're able to point back to a time where we were on the banks of the Red Sea and things look dire and desperate and we're able to, this is what he does, he gives everybody a testimony to say, God came and made a difference. He delivered me and that's why I praise him and that's why I continue to worship him because he, he didn't just give me a set of principles, or He didn't just give me a creed to confess, or He didn't just give me this idea, I might go to Him. He, he came and He met me. And that's a promise that goes to every one of you and all of us today, is that Jesus will meet you, because that is what He's interested in doing as a deliverer and as a Savior. And you, what do you need to do? You need only to be still and to receive it, because that's what Moses tells the people to do. So much of our lives is frenetically spent trying to do things for ourselves. I, I know this since ministry has picked up since the pandemic. Um, everything, ministry is no exception to it. Every job, it seems, has become uh, burdened with the constant and ceaseless production and trying to create and move forward and do more things. And some of it, a lot of it is necessary, maybe some of it not so much. It's really hard to push against that in our culture. But salvation isn't like that, particularly as we find it in this deliverance. So here's some good news for you today. If you're fed up of that culture and you're tired of it and you think anything in your life that you have to achieve, you have to tirelessly work for it and keep pushing forward and add more effort to it in order to achieve it and get it. For salvation, you need only to be still because as good Reformed Protestants, we believe that it has actually nothing to do with our efforts or our works. There's nothing you're able to add to salvation. There's nothing you're able to do that can earn it or get it. You need only to be still and you will find God's deliverance and you will find that overwhelming sense of peace and gratitude from the fact that God has simply delivered you by His power and that He will give you a new life and a new heart and, and bring you into His kingdom and give you that peace and hope and purpose and He'll do it all because this passage is all about Him and what He does and we need only to be still. He permits Pharaoh. He delivers and saves his people. He becomes their Yeshua. And finally, he destroys death. Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and the Lord drove the sea back, and the Israelites went right over. And the Egyptians pursued them, and Pharaoh's horses and chariots and horsemen fell into the sea. Stretch out your hand, the Lord said to Moses, so the waters may flow back over the Egyptians and their chariots and horsemen. And he did this. And as the Egyptians were fleeing towards it, the Lord swept them into the sea. The final chapter of the saga of Pharaoh and his people, and Pharaoh's great demonstration of power and might, is that God has ultimately shown who was the true God between himself and Pharaoh. But more importantly than that, the Egyptians and Pharaoh in this story were a, an emblem of the cycle of destruction and death. Remember how, I think it was last week, when we thought about the dehumanizing labor of, of slavery in any of its forms, modern or ancient, and how the people were being ground down almost into dust and they were becoming inseparable from the dust they were having to use to try and make bricks. 
because the entire system and regime was propped up on this unspeakable evil, uh, denying the fact that people were image bearers of God and that they were not supposed to be used as mechanical tools in an empire of continued wealth and money making. And it's a warning really about the dangers of empire in many ways. And so the whole system of Egypt spoke of slavery, which leads to death, and then increased death, which leads to more slavery to try and keep the cycle going. And with this dramatic show of God's power, what he has said is essentially, I've swallowed up that system and that death. And it was so that the Israelite people, as they looked back, would have a visual cue of not only can God get us out of a tight spot and a sticky situation, not only can God deliver us from what we're panicking and fearful about in this moment, but he even has the power to remove the very source of what has caused us so much panic, distress, and, and, and for us has just been a marker of, of pure death and destruction and evil. And there's a lovely verse, um, I think I preached on it one communion in, in the prophet Isaiah chapter 25, where God says that he will uh, fold up the shroud that envelops people, indeed that he will swallow up death itself forever. And it's a wonderful hope that the people of God in Israel had and looked forward to. And then where do we see that fulfilled? In the cross of Christ. Because as Paul says in Colossians, he has put to shame and conquered over the evil powers, the hostile powers, and the principalities. The same force, which is, is spiritual, you know, really it's ultimately dynamic. <laughs> demonic. The same force, the serpent-like evil that has attacked and interpolated itself into God's creation since the earliest times, and that had full and wholesale control of Pharaoh as he tried to create and build an empire on nothing but evil and degradation. The same force that then leads to nothing but death and then that ultimately causes death and separation from God and loved ones. The promise and the hope of the gospel that starts all the way back here is, is that we'll all be able to do what the Israelites did and look back one day and go, there is death and it's been destroyed and swallowed up by God. Because at the very end of the book, that's exactly what God does. The promise is that he shall for his sins, he shall wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death and sorrow will be no more. May God bless his word to us this morning. Amen.